Only 15% that watch my videos are subscribed. Please don't forget to if you like my content. This helps me out a lot. Enjoy the video. I had everything I needed. Pistol with silver bullets. Silver blade, the only thing that could kill the beast. Sturdy pickup truck that could follow it through the mud if necessary. Adequate food and water that could last me for days. I wanted to kill this thing so badly. I could feel the rage pumping through my veins, corrupting my blood, and sending me into a near frenzy. It ripped my father in half right in front of me, remorselessly, with an apparent blood lust that I'm still trying to process. I lived alone with my father for a few years, taking care of him, helping him do basic things because he had become decrepit in the last several years. We lived in a small shack on the edge of nothing, a bleak and dense wilderness. He often told me stories of the wilderness, of those that went in and never came back out, or if they did, they were forever changed. Many nights I would sit on the back porch, sipping beer and staring out at the thick line of trees. My father and I would go hunting in those woods, but only so far. We could always see the cabin from our stomping grounds. In a weird way, I developed the belief that as long as we were in the shack's sight, that it would protect us. Which, of course, was shattered when my father got brutally murdered in front of me that night. I probably would have been a goner too. Except in my desperation and terror, I picked him out of the Bible and held it in front of my chest. The werewolf howled and its fist froze an inch from the book and promptly pulled back. It then sat on its haunches and whined like a puppy. For a brief second, my gaze turned incredulously to the book, and when I glanced back up again, the beast had gone. I wept for my father, and when the tears were spent, I buried him in the backyard. After my grief somewhat subsided, I collected my thoughts and a new goal formed in my head. That of vengeance. I'd often sit on the back porch and stare at the Bible, thinking about how it saved my life that night. Then I remembered what the priest had happened to his wife many years back. I couldn't believe I didn't think about it before now. I did hesitate, but my dad had been religious, at least vaguely, and had a sort of tenuous friendship with Father George at one point. So I made the trip. About half a mile down the road, the decent-sized house sat right at the end, seeming like a damn thing. I remembered the whispers around town, that the priest veered from his faith, and that was why his wife had died. I took a few deep breaths and got out of the car, walking up the gravel road and knocking on the door. The day was fine enough, a bit overcast, and just a little chilly, but okay. I stared out at the priest's acres and felt a sense of peace, my very first slice of it since my father died. Father George opened the door and smiled, and not the fake kind of smile my father and I had been given because we were poor. He just saw us as members of his flock. I wasn't necessarily a religious man, but I admired his consistency if nothing else. I came into the living room and he asked if I wanted anything to drink. I said just a bottle of water would be fine, if he had any. Once he emerged from the kitchen, he handed me the bottle of water and sat down. After an uncomfortable silence, which only lasted a couple of seconds, I spoke up. Father George, I won't lie, as I believe you'd frown on that kind of thing, but I came here for a reason. I know you always liked my father and I, and, well, something has happened to him. Something similar to what happened to your wife. What you said happened. Father George cleared his throat, maintaining his silence for a few more seconds. Then he said, I try not to think about that night, but when I do, my heart is filled with a rage that I just can't let go. I am practically a feeble old man. I want to take vengeance on the beast that killed my wife, but two things are stopping me. I am a holy man. Secondly, as I said, physically, I do not think I am up to the task. I told him that I was. The same beast killed my father and would have done the same to me if I hadn't held the Bible in front of me. Father George paused. That is interesting. Since I was wearing something holy, it didn't occur to me that it could have been the reason I wasn't mauled by the beast. All of this seems to suggest that it is an instrument of holy vengeance, and my own sense of right and wrong pales in comparison. But it killed your wife, the woman you loved. Father George's eyes became moist and he looked away. I need your help, Father. 
You are the only other one who knows about the wolf. And honestly, I can't do this alone. I am not the only one, Father George said. There is one other. Her husband fell victim to it, or so she claims. But I do not know if you can trust the woman in the woods. Father George told me that a woman lived in the woods, not far from the main road. He told me he would consider what I said, but that I should leave for now so that he could collect his thoughts. I got up in my car and left. Even though he told me I couldn't trust the woman, nonetheless, I was compelled to seek her out. I parked my car near the shack my father, and I built with my own hands. Then I went behind the shack and entered the woods. I could have just parked my truck anywhere on the side of the gravel road, but I didn't want anyone in town, especially Father George to see me entering and exploring the woods. He above all us would know what I was up to. I believed Father George was being authentic and telling how things were from his perspective. But being a priest and everything, his view was restricted to what he currently believed. I had to travel my own path. The woman's tent didn't take long to find, not really. I probably hiked for about a mile all total, combing the woods back and forth until I saw it. My heart skipped a beat as I realized this was the farthest I had ever been into the wilderness. An elderly woman was hanging her clothes on a line, the ends of the line supported by two trees directly opposite each other. The tent looked small, but I spotted a luxurious rug inside, a wooden chair and desk, and smaller items that I thought might have been talismans or something. The old woman saw me. Her eyes grew big and she made to flee. I held up my hands, backing off a little. I just want to talk about your husband, I said. She halted in her tracks. Who told you about that? I hesitated. The priest who lives in town. The woman spat on the ground. That bastard has been spreading rumors about me for years. Well, I haven't heard them. She hesitated for several moments, then offered me to come into her tent and hear the real side of the story, as she put it. The woman introduced herself as Bethany. She said she and her husband had run a small business in town years and years ago and based on the dates, it happened before I was born. After I said what had happened in the shack on that fateful, horrific day, she told a similar story to mine and to Father George's about how the werewolf broke into the place and slaughtered him right there. Bethany said it was the most traumatic experience of her life and Father George painted her a liar. No one could corroborate her story, of course, but charges weren't brought. It explained why she fled the town and decided to live in the woods. The town had shamed her. I wasn't sure why I never heard the stories, or maybe my dad did and just didn't tell me. I would have thought one of the other people in town would have told me, but maybe she was the town's dirty secret, or maybe they were afraid of her. If you don't believe me, Bethany said, go to the only abandoned building in town. It used to be a dry cleaning service. I do not go inside the buildings anymore because the werewolf only kills inside buildings. It cannot kill you in front of anything you have built with your own two hands, but inside it has domain. Father George has no doubt told you he thinks the beast is an instrument of holy vengeance, and I believe that's true. This is a weakness of it, however, and for reasons that are unknown to me. Bethany said she wouldn't talk to me further until I had checked out the old one-story building. I remember passing it hundreds of times during my lifetime, never giving it much thought except how creepy it looked. The door to the building opened easily. Large chunks of wood were missing where the doorknob should have been. Clearly, people had broken into it over the years. I opened the door and went inside. Everything was dark, and I turned on my flashlight, always kept several in the car. Something my dad taught me when I was younger. You do not want to be stranded somewhere, in a strange place, completely in the dark. I shone the bright beam all over the large room near the desk, scanning the rows of empty racks. I didn't see anything of interest at first. Then someone's ghost materialized in front of me, and I let out a scream, almost dropping the flashlight, and I was trembling too severely to move or flee. Bethany never should have cursed the beast, it said. I know she did it to avenge my death, but it's only brought pain to her. The ghost's voice was wispy. I could barely hear it, but the whispers sent violent shivers down my spine. The man had clearly been killed in a grisly way, similar to my dad, and I tried to avoid looking at the ghastly wounds. 
It remained for several seconds before wavering and disappearing. As soon as the trembles ceased and I knew the ghost had gone, I fled the building. I hurriedly opened the truck door, fumbled putting the key in the ignition, finally turning it. I took the car out of park and peeled the hell out of there. I had unfinished business with the woman in the woods. Based on what the ghost of her husband said, it stood to reason that she was responsible for the wolf creature killing my father. After all, it seemed that her cursing the beast resulted in something horrible happening. The ghost disappeared before I could find out what. On the other hand, the woman cursed the wolf creature to avenge the death of her husband. So it killed before that. Bethany was still putting her clothes on the line when I came to her little clearing. A pang of sympathy momentarily sliced through me. I was still angry at the prospect that she was responsible for the beast killing my father, but I didn't see it as deliberately murderous, more like blind fury. I met your husband a little while ago, I said. His ghost. You didn't tell me I'd meet a fucking ghost, I said. I can still see the terror in your eyes. You are telling me the truth, Bethany said. He told me that you cursed the beast to take revenge? My husband was a kind man but only told you part of the story. For some reason, I felt as if his ghost gave me the power to curse the beast, to channel its killing urge to annihilating those that lack faith. Because my study of the occult has led me to believe that the priest is responsible, albeit indirectly, for the origin of the wolf. It came to be because he had faith, then abandoned it. After the death of my husband and its transformation by my hand, the werewolf seems to seek the same in its victims. But his wife, I started. She died, yet he survived. You said that it seeks out those that are like him. He should have died. You mentioned the werewolf didn't attack you when you held the Bible. If Father George was dressed as a priest in that moment, he would have been spared. I found this strange. Sure, it explained why he had been spared that one time, but not all the other times after he could have killed. It didn't seem possible that he'd be dressed like a priest 24-7 or carrying a Bible. There had to be a better explanation. Honestly, I didn't know what to think. This werewolf seemed equal parts mystery and horror. I realized I couldn't rely on the perceptions of Bethany or the Father George. I needed time to think. I knew that each second that passed would give the werewolf another opportunity to kill me. I figured that as long as I held a Bible in my hands, I'd be safe. So much had happened that I couldn't even think straight. That was as much of a danger, if not a higher one, than giving the beast more time to annihilate me. Driving back to my shack, I noticed how deep the night had settled into everything, pervading every crevice my eyes could see, and all the hidden ones that people probably wished would just go away. Back at the shack, I sat on the wooden chair and leaned over the desk. I lit the lamp on the desk a few moments before, and a soft glow filled the room. I realized I hadn't gone through the trunk since Dad died, and that I probably should. I opened the trunk, seeing all the possessions he had accumulated over the years. Most of it was loose-leaf papers, or small, leather-bound journals. I did my best to go through them all, making sure to keep the Bible close for protection. Once I had read most of the journals and papers, I just sat there, incredulous. My dad had known the wolf, had conversations with it. I remembered he told stories of those who went deep into the woods and never came out, but apparently he was one of the lucky souls who did and lived to tell the tale. My mind returned to the question of why the werewolf had spared the woman in the woods and the priest while killing the priest's wife and the woman's husband. My rage at wanting the thing dead dissolved into an intense curiosity and then spiked into a constant state of low terror. I hadn't been very deep into the woods. My father had built a kind of vague mysticism around it. The thing he had used to instill such a feeling of terror in me was something I knew I needed to chase after, despite my fear. The woman believed that the werewolf killed her husband for reasons unknown to her and killed the priest's wife because of its lack of faith after she transformed it channeled it, as she claimed. But Father George had been wearing holy garb, equivalent to my Bible, so why had he been spared? She had even said the werewolf had been created from Father George's lack of faith. Not just lack of faith, but having abandoned his faith. 
Of course, the faith might have ebbed and flowed in the man, considering he was still a priest. But did the beast really make such distinctions? Underneath all the papers in the trunk was a secret panel. Inside lay a shining pistol. I checked to make sure it was still filled with silver bullets. It was. My father told me that if I ever needed to go into the woods, that I should take this pistol with me. But be warned, son. Despite what you might have read, you cannot kill the werewolf with a silver bullet. Only seriously wound it for a time. I grabbed the pistol and headed into the woods. The moon seemed suspended in a hammock of clouds, and I swallowed nervously. I know how werewolves are perceived, except my recent experience taught me that werewolves are real, and that they can be vicious killers, waiting to pounce from the dark at any moment. As I went deeper into the woods, my fear increased. I could feel my blood pumping in my ears, and my left hand shook around the pistol. I didn't even know what I was looking for, but for some reason I knew that if I went far enough into the woods, I'd find what I was looking for. Eventually I came across a cave tucked behind a thick line of trees. I barely glimpsed it as I scanned the trees, but then my eyes went back to the blur of gray between the trees. If the werewolf was hiding anywhere, it would be inside, I told myself. I crept closer to the cave, pointing my flashlight closer to the ground so that I wouldn't arouse attention. I jumped several times while approaching the cave, but the sources of the sounds were only harmless critters. Once I was near the mouth of the cave, I had no choice but to shine my flashlight inside. I didn't see anything at first, so I had to venture further into the cave. The beam bounced all over the cavern walls, and I noticed deep scratch marks that upon closer inspection were tally marks. When the beam finally caught a patch of dark brown fur, which seemed to shudder with each long, beastly breath, I screamed. Two red eyes, sleepy and menacing, peered from the bubble of darkness. You are your father's son, I know you, the werewolf said. Stay back, I said. Even though you savagely killed my father, I can't shoot you yet. It wouldn't even do any good because silver bullets can't kill you. I need to know. Why did you kill my father? Father George's wife? The husband of the woman in the woods. The woman said that she cursed you to attack those that lack faith. Father George lacked faith according to... That woman is a fool. She does not control me, although she thinks she does. The magic provided by her dead husband, the perfidious soul who deserves to languish, only increased my rage at those that are unfaithful. The pistol shook in my hands again. I tried to keep the beam steady, but it kept bouncing on the cavern walls. Wait, are you saying you annihilate those that have been unfaithful to their partners? The werewolf nodded and bared its teeth. What about my father? My mom died long ago. Are you saying he was with another woman? Your mother isn't dead. She still lives, but a thousand miles away. She thinks he is in the ground rotting, and you with him. He led a double life, and you in its shadow. Then the werewolf got on its legs, bared its teeth again, both red eyes radiating a murderous gleam. All of a sudden, the beast lunged. I fired the pistol. Two bullets landed in its chest, another in its right leg. It whimpered and fell to the ground. I emptied the remaining bullets into the beast, and its spasms seemed to roll together before it went entirely still. I cautiously approached the motionless body. Then what happened next, I'm not quite sure. The werewolf stirred, growled, and its claws barely missed my foot. A billowy cloud of smoke filled the cavern, first a deep and frightening black, then becoming white and ghostly. My feet and arms weren't my own until several minutes later. The white cloud surrounding me dissipated, not slowly, but suddenly. The ghost of Bethany's husband floated before me, looking as ghastly as ever. I remember my first posthumous visit to the werewolf, that horrid beast is filled with revelation, isn't he? I couldn't talk for several minutes. The terror needed time to loosen, and my mother was still alive. When I recovered my wits, he took me deeper into the woods, far enough from the cave that eventually I stopped looking over my shoulder. Bethany's husband led me to a great pine tree, which seemed taller than the others. At its base rested a small, ornate box. A bejeweled blade rested inside, the only thing that could kill the beast, according to the ghost. Shortly after, I embarked on the mission to remove the werewolf from this town I lived in most of my life, 
but I soon found that it wasn't easy to stalk and kill. It always seemed to be one step ahead of me. With the ghost's help, I tracked it to a gas station in the middle of nowhere, an abandoned one at that. I finally thought I had cornered the thing. Part of me didn't want to extinguish it for good because it had known about my mother. It knew about my dad's secrets, that he uprooted me from my childhood home that I didn't even remember, and placed me in this strange, isolated town, where my life had been reduced to hunting a werewolf that, as far as I was concerned, knew the deepest, darkest secrets of the universe. My name is Boston Murphy and I kill werewolves for the US government. I didn't join the army to get medals or to have a statue in my honor. I joined it to simply get away from my family. My father is okay but his new wife's the most evil person you could have the misfortune of meeting. She used to constantly berate me, calling me less than dirt and a waste of space. I tried telling dad, but he didn't believe it or chose not to believe it. I joined the army when I was 17. It was the only way of getting away from the verbal abuse. Stepmom couldn't be happier that I was finally out of her house, but Dad was crushed. He understood why I chose to do it, but he still felt like it was his fault. It was shipping out day and he gave me an emotional send-off. It was time to start my own life. I arrived to Fort Bronson by Thursday. I still remember having goosebumps arriving. This was it. I was really doing this. No turning back now. Fort Bronson was a massive base expanding over 60 acres. The bus stopped, and drill instructor Haymeyer walked on board, gracing us with his hospitality. Attention, you piss cans. I'm Instructor Haymeyer. I'll be your friend for the next 18 weeks. Now get your sorry asses off my bus and get checked in. Do I make myself clear? Sir, yes, sir, we all shouted in unison. We got our bags and got off the bus. Since I was sitting in the very back, I was the last one to leave. Haymeyer looked at me and stopped me. What's your name, cadet? He asked. Be Boston Murphy, sir, I replied nervous. He looked me up and down, muttering to himself. You're not going with them. You're going to special assignment ward, Haymeyer said. I haven't been here more than ten minutes and I'm already getting a special assignment. Where is that, sir? I asked. In the room next to the mess hall in the north building. Now get the hell off my bus. Haymeyer replied. I quickly got my bags and left. The North Building was the farthest building on base away from everyone else. The sun was furious that day I was sweating hard, yet I walked at a brisk pace. All I know it could be the first test. I entered the building, the air conditioning inside greeted me like an old friend. The place was a maze of stairs and hallways, I had to use my map. The mess hall was located on the, the second hallway. I climbed the stairs carrying my luggage with me. This building seemed less maintained than the other buildings but who am I to judge? As I approached the mess hall, I turned to the door to the left. It looked like a janitor's closet. It had a faded special assignment sticker on the door. I opened it. A rush of old, musty air ambushed my nose. Once inside, I walked down a long hallway. There was no paint on the walls. It was gray. The fluorescent lights shined bitterly. Through a pair of double doors, I entered a waiting room. The place was empty. Only a receptionist and another cadet populated the place. I went to the receptionist. Name, please, she said. Boston Murphy, I replied. She checked her notes, sighing. I don't see you in my notes. You must be new. Y yeah instructor Haymeyer sent me here, I said, sweating. She dialed a number on her phone, motioning me to take a seat. I did what she asked. The other cadet in the room was a skinhead called James. You knew here too, huh? He asked. Yeah, man, I replied. Me too, I was so ready to kick some jihadi ass, but I'm here instead, you feel me? He asked. Yeah. I lied. The truth was that I didn't join to kill. I was hoping to be a medic or something. My name's James, what's yours? He asked. Boston. I replied. You seem cool, Boston. Personally, I hope this was a mistake. I want to hit the range and make those bastards pay for 9-11, James said. Cadet James Fillmore, the receptionist said. I guess that's my key, see ya, brother, James said, patting my back. I waited to be called in, watching videos on my phone. 
The receptionist on the phone looked at me every so often, whispering. After what seemed like centuries, I was finally called up. The receptionist told me to go through the double doors and into the first door on the right. I walked through, luggage in hand. The hallway I walked in was small and dark. The door on the right said, Lycanthropy Extermination with Greg Romero. Lycanthropy like in werewolves? This had to be a joke. Surely Haymeyer played a prank on me, testing how gullible new recruits are. I looked further down the hall. It only got weirder from there. Wendigo Extermination with Susan Fletcher. Thunderbird Extermination with Otto Haymeyer. Zombie Extermination with Tony Stevenson. I had half a mind to walk out and confront Haymeyer, but something told me that he didn't appreciate being called a liar. Despite my doubts, I walked in. Inside it looked like a regular classroom having desks and such. James was sitting in the back while I sat near the front. Hey Boston, small world, am I right? He asked. I suppose, I replied. I sat down, and a man started speaking. Welcome cadets, I'm Greg Romero, and for the next 18 weeks I'll teach you how to dispatch a lichen rock. Mr. Romero said. James raised his hand. Aren't werewolves fake though, he asked. I wish they were fake, but no, they're not. Lichen rocks pose a serious threat to livestock and humanity as a whole, Mr. Romero replied. I raised my hand. Where's the rest of the class? I asked. Romero sighed. We're not as popular as Wendigo extermination, but hopefully we'll receive more recruits next year. Romero showed a photo of a mutilated woman being eaten by a werewolf. I gagged. We have a thankless job, gentlemen. Only two people know we exist, and that's the two of you. Who wants to kill a wolf? Romero asked. We both shouted in unison. For the next 18 weeks, I was taught how to kill a wolf. Silver does kill one, but instead of a crossbow, I got a Mini-14 with silver bullets. I was trained how to track wolves and how to survive in the wild. It was hard at first, but I got the hang of it. On graduation day, I was so happy James and I got drunk at his place. At first, I didn't like James, but during training we became friends. I was deployed to Arizona of all places. The assignment was simple, an elderly lichen rock was spotted in the area, and I had to dispatch him. I had to cut off its right hand as proof and return it to my bosses. I was getting paid $100,000 for this. Since I was new, this assignment was sort of a test to see if I have what it takes. I arrived to Ground Zero, a campsite. The brass in Washington were nice enough to close its surrounding area, so nobody could get hurt. I looked for clues, only to find a patch of hair. It smelled like piss, meaning that a wolf was nearby. The hair led deep into the brush into the desert. The sun was angry that day. It cooked my skin under all my armor. It led to an abandoned farmhouse, but any sign of a farm was dried up a long time ago. I crept to a window, rifle in hand. I peeked, and not only did I see the wolf, but there was also two little wolves seemingly surrounding him. Come on, Grandpa, let's go play, one of the little ones said, nibbling on the big one's ear. In a while, kids, I have to rest, he replied. My hands were shaking, sweat dripped from my brow. I had to do this, I was getting paid to. I took a deep breath, then I kicked down the door. I opened fire, shooting the big one in the chest four times, sending him backwards. The kids looked on in horror, screaming and crying. I brought out my axe and hacked off his right hand. I placed it in my bag, the puppies still crying. Shut your fucking mouths, I yelled, pointing my rifle at them. They only screamed louder. I panicked. I didn't want to fail my first mission. I did what I had to. I shot the puppies, hitting them both in the head. I hacked off their right hands, putting them in my bag. Once the adrenaline died, I threw up. What's done is done, I can't fix it. I had $300,000 in my bag, softening the blow. I returned to my boss and gave them the hands. They were surprised, to say the least. Damn, not only did you take out that old fuck, but you popped his grandkids too. You're the best exterminator we ever had. No mercy. I'm gonna call you Eisenerv from now on, okay? My boss said signing me a check. It was from the United States Treasury, $300,000. I placed the money in my bank account when I got home. Before I left, my boss said, your new assignment is to dispatch wolf pups spotted in Alaska, but I don't think that would be a problem for you, Eisenerv. He winked. It made me sick. 
I reloaded my silver ammo, bought some beef jerky, and flew to Alaska. A logger found a wolf pup hanging out around the woods near his house and locked it in his shed. I told him to stay back in case it got aggressive. I went in, closing the door behind me. Huddled in the corner, I saw four wolf pups. They looked scared. I wasn't proud of what happened next. I fired, and I took their hands. I returned to my boss and turned in the hands. He gave me 400,000 this time. Eisenerv, you're making your country safer every time you go out. You're a hero, son, he said. I don't feel like a hero, sir, I replied. Just know this, they're monsters, they don't know right from wrong, all they know is killing. Take two months off, then come back, okay? He said, sending me off. I still don't feel like a hero. I want him before he wants me. I am 23 years old and sipping mint juleps from red plastic cups when I see him. His polo shirt is stained with the brown of a chocolate stout, and his hair smells of vague lotion and barber soap, and the seams of his shirt are pulled too tight against his chest. I finish my drink sloppily and find him standing in a circle around beer-stained playing cards, and when I give him my name and number, and I see the lights dance in his eyes, I know he is mine. When he first holds me in his arms, we have been dating for 12 hours, and I want him. We sit in the squeaking rocking seat of a Ferris wheel and watch the city lights flash like fireflies beneath us. I tell him about wildflowers and macro photography, and he tells me about hydroelectric dams. Then I tell him to stop talking. He asks if I believe in ghosts. No, I say, there are no ghosts here. He wraps his arms around me and I taste the soft smile on his lips. When he takes me home that evening, he opens the door like a gentleman, and he shakes my father's hand with a firm grip, and I know we will marry. We do or we will, but first he takes me camping. We take small sips from water bottles as we ascend. The backpack rubs heavy on my shoulders. My legs ache, and the sun brings blistering red on not sunscreen painted forearms. In the heat of summer, the sultry air is thick with mosquitoes and tastes of earthworms. Here, a kingfisher dances on branches and watches the river for the flash tail of a trout. There, a porcupine snoozes in the curled lump of a spruce branch. We pitch our tent atop pine needles and moss. Do you like the moonlight, he asks? Yes, I say. Do you like the crickets and the frogs, he asks. Yes, stop talking. Tell me you love me, love me, he does. The bushes stir. Coupled in his arms, I wake. Hear the chittering and groaning of rocks and leaves in the world. A twig snaps. An owl hoots and flees and leaves the camp in stunted silence. Did you hear that? Is nothing. Wait, I think, um... When the claws dig into the plastic of the tent, I scream. He jumps to a crouch and reaches for a hunting knife. But the claws have done their work and the eyes of the creature are red, red, red. It howls, growls, and the sound from its throat is twisted and beautiful and terrible. It lunges, and its claws bring a spurt of fresh blood and I scream and scream and kick and bite and scratch. It does not matter. At the end, he is bloody and his throat is ripped raw and I hold his hand until the last, until he is warm but unmoving, and the floor of the tent is slicked with blood. The creature he stabbed fled into the night. A bite mark on my shoulder stings and burns and throbs with pain. Not natural, and I know that I am forever broken. They tell me about lines. Two, they say, means pregnant. When I tell them my would-be husband is dead with a ripped throat and a closed casket, they smile and give condolences and say things they think matters. Nothing matters. The moonlight starts to hurt and makes my skin crawl like a hundred spiders are beneath my skin, burning, pulsing. The moonlight burns, I say. Yes, they say. I'm sorry. At home I paint the crib a beautiful pastel blue and read parenting books until I can stack them twelve high on the counter. I take pictures from the walls, share photographs with my would-have-been step-parents. They hold their tears with mine, and we go through scrapbooks, baby photographs, embarrassing prom pictures. You were his first, they say you were special. They say they'll help with the baby. I say thank you and goodbye and think, why couldn't the creature have taken me instead? When my son arrives, he brings a pain I cannot describe through words alone. 
The doctors pump my spine with an intravenous drip and tell me to push, to breathe. They hold my hand. My father and stepfather wait outside and make small talk in the way only wounded parents can. Please, I tell my son, behave, be kind to me, he is not. In the end, my lips are bloody and my legs lose feeling and the doctor hands me the small lump of flesh that cries and coos. I hold his hand and his small fingers curl around my thumb and at that moment, I know he is the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. There might be problems, the doctors say, complications. My son is covered in a thin veneer of fur. My shoulder pulses with phantom pain. The virus might have spread to him, they say. He might not be fully human, I, I don't care. I love him, I love him, I love him. My son grows like a pup. In a year, he can walk and run and speak in short stunted sentences. He stacks blocks in his crib and giggles whenever the top block falls. He sleeps curled in a blanket and he bats his hands at the mobile above him. Your father would have loved you, I say. He would have, he would have. He says mama and mama. I force the pills down his throat and mine whenever the moonlight is strongest. He tells me about school. The class made finger-painted pictures, and I hang them on the fridge. I tell him he is talented and brilliant, even though the image looks like a monstrous tree. There are streaks of red in the stomach of the stick figures. The sun in the corner is colored silver. I ask him if he is hungry, and he nods. I feed him steak and cut and season the raw cubes with salt and pepper. He says he wants chicken. We eat it raw. They come for him in the daylight. They take him on his walk home, and he squirms, and he screams, and I tell myself he fought them to the last, though I cannot know the truth. They say money, 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 and they say pills, pills. I tell them to go fuck themselves. When I speak to the police, I beg and plead and tell them every detail I think will matter. Then I pace the floor of his bedroom, count the colored pills in the bottle, and check the calendar. One week until the full moon. I stare at the magnets on the wall. I picture the monster in my mind's eye, the glowing eyes and dagger-white claws that ripped and tore and took my husband from me. I'd like to think the beast was scared, afraid, not in control. I'd like to think it had no choice and I'd like to think it died slowly after my husband plunged the hunting knife into its still beating heart. But I know it survived because no steel can kill it. I tell them about money. I don't have it yet, I say. I won't have it for a week. I ask to speak to my son, and they put the phone against his ear. He says, Mommy, I'm scared. I ask if they've been feeding him, and he says yes, though I do not know if he means cooked meat or raw, and I do not know if the men understand what he is, what we are, and what we can become. I have never seen my son changed. I do not know if he even knows what the raw moonlight will do to him. I need to buy time. I need to breathe. I need to think. None of the twelve parenting books stacked on the counter have prepared me for the inevitable fear of losing a child. I've lost one man and I cannot, will not lose another. The police will never know the truth. I learn about moonlight. Beneath my skin is a thousand needle pricks. It waits in my blood, my bones. It stalks my footsteps and hunger beneath my eyes. It waits. I pull a hood around my head and travel to the park. They come with my son wrapped in a shawl. They come with guns. I do not think guns can stop me. I think blood flesh ripped hair. I think wolf wolf wolf. I remove my hood and the moonlight hits my face and the screaming starts. I hold my son in my arms. He crees because he does not understand. He asks what happened and why the men screamed and why it hurt so bad. I tell him to drink water and take the pills and wait. I tell him that I love him. I wipe the blood from my chin. I rip the bullets from my arm with a pair of tweezers. They go plink plink on the tile, and I wipe the blood away with a rag. I'm not sure whose blood runs innocently down the sink. I tell my son I love him, and I hold him, and I tell him his father would be proud, that he was so brave. I tell myself those things too. I try to believe them, even when I cannot. My friend Alex loves partying. He organized a party at his parents' place for New Year's Eve and wanted to make it the biggest one yet since his parents were out of town. 
He invited a bunch of friends and told them to invite their own friends, with the only condition being that they should bring some booze. His parents have a luxurious house, which has enough room for two entire football teams, so Alex wasn't overly concerned about the place being crowded. When I arrived around 10.30 p.m., the music was already blaring three blocks away, and most of the people were pretty drunk. I joined in on the drinking, and soon enough got tipsy. It was around this time that I noticed one girl at the party, who seemed to be standing next to the wall on her own, holding a cup in her hand. She immediately caught my eye because she was otherworldly beautiful. She had long blonde hair and blue eyes. The blue dress she wore prominently showed her sultry figure, and it was all I could do not to stare. She seemed to catch my gaze and smiled as she took a sip from her cup. Yo, Daryl, you having a good time? Half-drunken Alex wrapped his arm around my shoulders, almost spilling his drink on me. I leaned in and shouted in his ear so that he could hear me over the loud music. Yeah, man. Hey, listen, who's that girl over there? What? He raised his eyebrows and leaned in closer. I repeated my question and once he glanced at the girl, he said, I don't know her name, man, but Matt's been with her. Says she's a beast in bed. Huh, I said, catching the girl's gaze once more. I had just ended a three-year-long relationship, so I wasn't really looking for anything serious. A one-night stand sounded like a perfect way to end the shitty year that was 2019. Alex leaned in to shout something in my ear. Hey, but even though she fucks like a nymph, Matt said he'd never interact with her again. Why? I asked. Alex shrugged. No idea. He just said that inviting her home was the worst idea. Hey, Jamie. His attention went to another friend that passed by, and I was left alone with my own thoughts, as difficult as they were to be heard in such a loud place. Matt was pretty picky with women, so having another girl that isn't to his liking was no big news. I realized that the girl was still staring at me with a seductive smile, so I allowed the alcohol in my blood to give me the surge of courage I needed to approach her. We introduced each other and made some shallow small talk. She said her name was Melissa, and after a few brief exchanges, I asked her to dance. She said yes, spurring me to try and take things even further. As we danced, things started getting more heated between us and at one point, Melissa wrapped her arms around my shoulders and leaned in as she said, Do you have a place? We can take this somewhere more private. She bit her lip as she said so and continued dancing gently. I got an apartment, not too far away, we can use my car, I said my boner practically talking instead of me. She nodded and before anyone noticed, we were out of Alex's house. We barely managed to enter my apartment with our clothes still on, and as soon as I locked the door behind us, she stopped kissing me and said, Wait, wait. Before we do this, there are some things you need to know about me. What things? I said, kissing her neck, not caring about talking right now. She gently pushed me away, blushing and panting, and said, Please, this is very important. Listen to what I have to say and I promise I'll let you do anything you want with me later. She ran her hand across my inner thigh. I was so horny at that moment I just wanted to jump on her, but I nodded and agreed to let her speak. She sat upright on the couch and exhaled before she said, All right, so, there are a couple of rules you need to follow because otherwise you may put yourself in danger. Oh, great, I thought to myself, she has STD or something. She continued, the first thing you need to know is now that we started this, we need to finish it to the end. If we don't, you'll have eight years of bad luck. If you ask me to leave after we've had sex, something even worse may happen. I frowned in confusion, but before I could ask anything, she continued. If you see my eyes turning red during sex, close your own eyes, but don't stop. You're going to hear me making deep, guttural noises, but they should be gone within a minute or so. Again, just don't open your eyes during that time. I can't be responsible for what happens to you if you do. If you feel that you might lose your erection, try to focus on something to hold it, at least until the weird noises stop. If you feel my grip getting painfully firm on you, like claws, stop moving and I'll gradually let you go. After we are done having sex, I will ask you some questions, like how it was for you. Have you had any better partners? how many girls you slept with, etc. I will need you to answer this as truthfully as possible. I'll know if you lie. 
Once we are ready to go to bed, put a piece of any kind of raw meat out of the fridge on the counter and leave it there overnight. We'll be sleeping in the same bed, so if you touch me during the night and I feel ice cold, ignore me. I may wake up and try to coax you into speaking to me by asking you a question or becoming hysterical. Whatever I do, just ignore me. I won't hurt you, so as long as you pretend I'm not there, you'll be fine. If you wake up and find me staring through the window, get out of the apartment as quickly as you can. Don't bother getting dressed. Just get out. If you wake up and I'm not there, call out to me. You're going to hear one of the following things. Either me saying that I'll be right back or calling you to come out. Ignore the latter. That's not me. And last but most important rule, make sure to set your alarm and wake up at exactly 6.06 a.m. If you see me still in bed by then, covered with the blanket over my head, get out of the apartment as quietly as you can. I will be out of your apartment by 6.05 a.m. No exceptions. That's all. She exhaled, staring at me in anticipation. I stared back, with mouth agape. I hadn't even realized how dumbfounded and breathless I was until she finished. So, do you have any questions? She shrugged. Um, no, I mean, everything is clear. Give me a moment, please. I need to use the bathroom. I fumbled to form a sentence and excused myself to the toilet. While there, I texted Matt. Hey bro, you know a girl named Melissa? His response came almost immediately. Yeah, why? I said. Well, I hooked up with her, but I heard you said there was something wrong with her. What's her problem? Matt read my message right away, but responded only after a minute. Did you invite her home? The message made me feel uneasy. I started to type when his next message came through. Bro, please tell me you didn't invite her home. I did. I responded, my hands practically shaking by this point. Fuck, fuck, Matt replied. What is it? I asked, now starting to feel full-blown panic. He said, you have to go through with her rules now. Don't kick her out before she decides to leave on her own. She will be out of there by 6.05 a.m. Bro, what are you talking about? I'll just tell her I'm not feeling well and send her home. Don't do that. Listen do me, don't fucking do it. He immediately responded. Why? I asked. He typed for a moment before saying, because my friend Kit did it, and they found him dead in his bed two days ago. Just then, three slow knocks resounded on my bathroom door. The full warm moon. The Algonquins used to call Ontario their home before it was discovered. Now the land and so many of its names have been repurposed by those who think that stealing an idea makes them the best people to teach those who have been robbed. But why a worm moon? I asked Hugh. He reached out and tucked a lock of hair behind my ear. I leaned into it because I know that he likes it, the same way that he likes explaining things as though I didn't already know. The earth is finally soft enough to herald the oncoming spring. Things that were dead will be alive again, he whispered looking up at the pitch black sky. The worms know this before everyone, because we all end up as the greatest delicacy a worm can crave. His face was alabaster in the moonlight. Hugh licked his lips. Is that why you wanted a midnight picnic? I asked with half a smile. He huffed. It's because we're seeing something beautiful, Olivia. In two weeks, the greatest celestial dance will cause a solar eclipse. Which is why there's a lunar eclipse tonight at the full moon, I finished dreamily. Hugh barred his teeth. Is there a reason you needed to interrupt my story, Olivia? I turned away, suddenly uncomfortable. I was just making conversation, Hugh. Look, it's getting late, and... He wrapped a hand around the back of my neck, and I froze as chills ran up and down my spine. No one around but the two of us, he whispered. I licked my lips. It's very private. No one around, Hugh whispered as he lowered his mouth to my shoulder. Did you know that a wolf can eat 4.217 pounds in a day? Pulling aside my cardigan, he nibbled at my skin. I shuddered. Somehow he seemed paler as the moon grew brighter. It was unnerving. 
but the way his tongue touched my skin was painful. Ow. Hugh, what are you doing to my shoulder? That's ouch. Fuck. Hugh, what the... Then he pulled back, and it wasn't Hugh. Or more horrifyingly, it was him. Sort of. Those same pinkish eyes looked back at me beneath facial hair that had sprouted up to his lashes. His long face, always gaunt, was now freakishly out of proportion with a jaw that fell to the middle of his chest, revealing long, sharp, yellow teeth. I froze in utter horror as the wolf pressed his claws into my arms. He was on top of me before I could resist. His nose now extended into a loop and snout that sniffed hungrily at my neck. I was pinned. The terror had overwhelmed me so quickly that the fight was over before I could understand what was happening. I stared up at the beast, unable to move, unable to process the fact that I was about to experience my final sensory input before the lights went out. Then it got darker, just slightly but enough to notice. A brr ooh, the wolf whined. Then he relaxed his grip. Swaying back and forth, he felt lighter, weaker. His face began to melt back into hues, not entirely, but sufficient to see the man behind the wolf. He lowered his head. And then I saw it, a partial lunar eclipse. The edge of the moon was weak as it fought against the Earth's shadow. What had been a bright picnic now got dimmer as the moon appeared lopsided. The hue wolf stayed on top of me, but he wavered. That was enough. I reached for my deepest strategy and used the most cunning move available in a pinch. I need Hugh in the balls. I was running while Hugh was still howling at the moon, his wails of agony rippling across an empty field that ensured we were totally alone. Fortunately, I had driven us here. Hugh seemed worried about driving, explaining that he had a hard time controlling a car in the full moonlight. I would kick myself for missing that sign, but who takes such a red flag seriously? I screeched my car into the driveway, stumbled out, and locked the front door behind me before taking a breath. Then I triple-checked every door and window lock, pulled down every shade, grabbed my chef's knife, and crawled into the corner of my closet. What was I going to do? Call the cops on a werewolf? No. The best thing to do was entrench myself in the darkest shadows from the moon, waiting until morning before facing a world that I would never see the same way again. I finally allowed myself to breathe. The fear and intensity of the moment hadn't allowed me to process what was going on. How am I supposed to categorize a werewolf? I shook my head. The important thing was that I was safe. Warmth spread through me, tingling my skin. I scratched my shoulder. Would anyone believe me? I had no proof of what happened. Would this come back to haunt me at the next full moon? My head spun as I scratched harder. Come to think of it, there was no realistic way out of this. No one capable of helping me would believe that Hugh was a werewolf. I scratched harder still, my shoulder becoming raw, as I realized a fundamental truth. The fact that people believe werewolves are a myth is a very strong argument that every werewolf encounter has been fatal. The panic came back full bore as my skin felt like it was breaking out in hives of anxiety. Had I really escaped at all? Then I looked down at the patch of skin on my shoulder I'd been scratching. The one Hugh had tickled with his teeth. The one with a prominent bite mark firmly outlined in my flesh. Panic shot through me as a patch of moonlight peeked through the blinds over my windows and crept beneath my closet door. I suddenly felt hungry. Oh, so hungry, and I knew that I would lose myself if I embraced the moonlight. But I can feel its call. So I wrote this and posted it with the strength I have. I hope I live until tomorrow.